Uh, so uh, the speaker for today is Karina Marco. She is a postdoc research fellow at the University of Valparaiso in Chile. She received her PhD from uh, Radio Astronomy and Astrophysics Institute of UNAM in Mexico in 2018, I believe. Uh, so today we will hear she talk about characterization of dust content in the ring around SZ-91 indications for planetesimal formation. So before Karina start, I have a reminder, if you have a clarification questions during the talk, please type them in the chat. Uh, so please keep your long question to the end of the talk. Okay, Karina, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers to give me the opportunity to be able to talk to you today about our recent work where we have used multi uh, wavelength ALMA observations in order to characterize those content in a joint transitional disk, which you can see here that is basically a ring of dust with a huge cavity. So first of all, uh, this work is in collaboration with all these people listed down here below. And we need to ask, to, to ask ourselves, why do we care about protoplanetary disks? So what is the main motivation behind this field in astronomy? So uh, the, the basic motivation is try to understand planet formation, of course, and how our own solar system form. So we know that protoplanetary disks are the birthplaces of planets. So in order to understand how um, planetary systems form, we need to go and st study the earliest stages of stellar formation when the protostar is surrounded by this massive disk of gas and dust. And the idea is try to understand what physical processes are uh, producing the evolution of the system from this early stage to a planetary system like our own solar system. But first of all, uh, what is a protoplanetary disk? So for that, we need to know a little bit about the disk structure. So here I show you an, a sketch of what a protoplanetary disk is from this review from Andrews uh, last year. So uh, the first thing is that uh, these disks are composed of gas mostly and also dust. But even though that the dust is just 1% is uh, dominate the, the opacity. So it's very important to study also the dust component in protoplanetary disks. So here on the sketch, you can see that the gray areas um, indicate the gas surface density or the gas density distribution in the system. You can see that uh, we have this monotonically decreasing distribution of gas where the densest part are uh, close to the star. So something that you have to take into account when you study protoplanetary disks is that different wavelengths or frequencies it trace different regions in, uh, the, in, the, in the disk. So for example, if you go and observe this disk in infrared scattered light, you will only be sensitive to or only proven the surface of the disk. So where the small grains are. But in contrast, if you go and observe that at some millimeter or millimeter observations using ALMA, for example, you will be sensitive to more deeper layers, so close to the, to the mid-plane, where we believe large particles are. So in order to have uh, like a big picture of what is going on in the system, you always need to use multi-wavelength um, studies, multi-wavelength observations, in order to have a, a better idea of the system. And you will know also that these disks also have this uh, flaring structure where you have higher and higher um, material above the mid-plane uh, with radial distance from the star. So uh, given that you have this distribution of gas, uh, there's going to be a very important process in protoplanetary disks. And that is what, what we know as the radial drift. So basically in protoplanetary disks, the small dust, so micron dust, is going to be well coupled to the gas. So it will move at superplanar velocities because the gas is supported by its own uh, pressure. But once you have larger grains in this, uh, these bigger particles wants to move at Keplerian velocity. So this difference in velocity will produce that these large particles will feel a headwind and that will produce then to lose angular momentum and then to drift to the inner parts. So basically the radial drift is the movement of the dust from the outer parts to the inner parts. And when they're moving, they're maybe getting to more and more denser regions and possibly they will be uh, growing there. We also have a movement of the dust from the upper layers of this to the mid-plane, which we, co we call them dust settling. And that will also promote green growth. But one problem that we have been um, realizing in this 
couple of decades is that radial drift is actually very efficient. So for example, a one meter body uh, will drift inward in a few hundred years. But we know that planets form, we observe exoplanetary system routinely now, and we know that the, there, there have to be some mechanisms that stops the grains in order to, they to, to be able to grow. So this, in, in this part, one thing that has been crucial is high resolution observations taking a submillimeter, for example, with ALMA, which has been a resolution in this, a revolution in this field. And here I show you one example of that, the large program D-Sharp, uh, at 1.23 millimeter. And you can see that here is uh, a couple of John uh, protoplanetaries and they all have these, these superstructures. You can see that most of them have rings, have gaps, have spiral arms, or even asymmetral asymmetries. And we know that these are places where the dust is uh, getting trapped and concentrating in there. So one solution, one proposed scenario that have been um, uh, in these recent years proposed is a pressure bomb. So basically you don't gonna have always this monotonically decreasing distribution of the gas, but you will have local maxima uh, in, uh, in, the, in the gas distribution. And that will produce that the, the particles will drift and will get trapped in these pressure bombs in this local maxima. And of course, these pressure bombs are now being related to uh, planet formation. So that planets are actually the responsible for these superstructures. So if you want to study planet formation, the main targets are this with superstructures and with cavities. So in that sense, Stress 91 is a very interesting source because it's a transitional disk, as you can see. Uh, this is the SED of the source. So this is a flux of the system as a function of wavelength. And you can see that it has this uh, typical morphology of a transitional disk where you have uh, less flux here at infrared wavelengths. Uh, so in this work from, from last year, we were able to estimate the, the properties, the stellar properties of the source. So the source is in the lupus tree molecular cloud. Uh, so about 160 parsecs away, it's around 0.6 solar masses. It's a theta star, so it's spectralized M0. Uh, it's actually accreting uh, right now and should be at least older than 3 million years. So how this source looks like. So here I show you um, different multi-wavelength observations that have been taken already for this source. So we have this work from Sukagoshi on 2019 using ALMA observations at 0.9 millimeters, so band seven. And you can see that is uh, is, is formed by just a single ring of dust. Uh, remember that ALMA observations is proven the mid plane of this with large particles. It has this huge cavity of about 83 AU. So in fact, is is the large the largest cavity around a single theta star observed so far. Um, but if you look, go and observe them in near infrared scattered light, so here in color, you can see that uh, this emission is peaking inside the submillimeter cavity. So again, near infrared observations are tracing the surface of a disk, smaller grains. So you have smaller grains inside the submillimeter cavity, and that is telling us something about dust filtration. And if you go and observe them in CO, so 12 CO here, uh, again from the Tukagoshi uh, work, uh, you can see that the, the gas is well spread. So it's well inside the, the submillimeter cavity, very close to the star, and also further out um, at about uh, 400 AU. So all these characteristics are very interesting because they have been related uh, with planet these interactions. So in this uh, work from, from last year, what we did was observe this sort at near infrared scattered light using the NACO instrument at the BLT. And we use this polarimetric differential imaging technique in order to try to characterize uh, the dust, uh, the small dust at the surface of this test. So we observe this source at two bands, at 1.7 and also 2.2 microns. You can see here the, the observations, the emission at these both bands. And the important thing is that these polarimetric um, or polarimetric data um, are sensitive to the dust uh, com composition and to the, the dust shape. So we can use them in order to characterize this small dust. So in this case, uh, a protoplanetary is expected to have a positive emission in the azimuthal direction, which is the Q5 images that I show you here on, on the left and on the middle panel. In the radial direction, you shouldn't expect to have any emission from a protoplanetary disk and can be taken as residual noise. So what we did was, uh, use a 3D red transfer code, in this case, ENCIFOS, to try to characterize dust uh, in the system. So this is what I show here on the bottom panel. So this, again, uh, the observations at 2.2 microns, the best model 
and their sequels. So what we found is that this um, infrared scatter light is peaking inside the submillimeter cavity at 45 AU, so well inside the submillimeter cavity. But also this implies that uh, the, best, the best composition for, for the grains that we found is very small grains, so less than 0.4 microns. And also they should be uh, relative porous with porosity of less than 40%. So this um, now implies two possible scenarios for the small dust in the surface of the disk. First, that indeed there are small grains at the surface of this, of this system, but also uh, another possibility is that the dust in the surface of the disk is um, composed of large aggregates, but the polarimetric observations is only sensitive to the small constituents of the large aggregates, so the monometers here in, in red, and is basically insensitive to the global size of of the, of the aggregate. Of course, we need uh, follow-up observations uh, at different bands and also uh, at the scatter light to, to retrieve the total intensity in order to be able to discriminate between these possible scenarios. But in any case, it's uh, a very in, in interesting uh, result that we found. Now, uh, given this large cavity, we wanted to, to go and search for companions inside the cavity. So for that, we observed this sort in LBAM, uh, again, using NACO at the BLT, so 3.8 microns, using the high contrast imaging. So unfortunately, we didn't detect any significant point source, but we can use these observations to estimate uh, sensitivity limits, mass sensitivity limits, and that's what I show you here. So you can see here the mass sensitivity limit as a function of the separation from the star. And you can see that we can rule out a massive planet beyond 45 AU. So massive planets greater than eight supermasses beyond 45 AU. Uh, but unfortunately for the inner regions inside or within 35 AU, our sensitivity constraints are not that good. So we cannot rule out uh, the presence of a binary system of a brown dwarf or giant planet. So we need to do more observations in order to really rule out um, the, the binary possibility in the system. Something that we also find uh, in the system and we, that we found a difference in the position angle given by the submillimeter observations of so the ALM observations here is in contour and white contrast and the NAC observations, the near infrared observations are in color here. So if we see the phase function for the NAC observations that I show you here on the right, for the north and the south part. So this is just a normalized flux as a function of a scattering angle. Basically this curve here, I trace are tracing the bright blobs emission here on the NACO observations. And you can see that for this position angle, which is what you estimate from the ALM observations, we have that the peak emission here on the phase function is separated by less than 23 degrees, more or less. And what we found is that this, um, this difference is minimized for a lower position angle, so for a position angle of nine degrees. So this difference in position angle between the semi-major axis observed with ALMA and the position angle of the disk in, in ARNAC observations can be explained by several uh, options. So the first one is that it's a signal to noise issue where ARNAC observations are not uh, sensitive enough to locate properly the, the intensity peaks. Another possibility is uh, have been proposed also in these papers here is the, that is a projection effect because we have this flare disk. So the NAC observations, the infrared observations are tracing the surface of the disk while the ALMA observations are tracing the, the, the mid plane. So you are actually uh, proving uh, different heights on, on the disk and that can be uh, what is producing this type of effect. And also uh, maybe that the NACO disk that we are observing is slightly warped. So um, we need, of course, uh, more signal to, to noise, uh, high signal to noise observations and more multi-wavelength observation in order to be able to discriminate between these possibilities. But in any case, this is um, implying that this, this can be highly structured. So given all these characteristics of the system, we have a, a well-confined submillimeter ring with a huge cavity. We have a smaller grains inside the cavity, which is telling us something about dust filtration. We have an uh, extended emission of, of 12 CO at least. And in this uh, work from Van der Marel 2018, uh, they even modeled the 12 CO emission with a gas depleted cavity at 37 AU. So there is gas inside the submillimeter cavity, 
but it may be depleted at some point. So all of these points to uh, planet uh, in, this, in the system, so multiple planets. So um, this makes uh, TRAS-91 a prime target to a study those trap and grain growth and all of that. So what we wanted to do now was try to characterize detail uh, in detail the dust component in this um, system and try to see if we found any more hints for planet formation. So that's what we did in our recent work from this year that went public uh, a, a few weeks ago. So what we did was try to observe uh, again with ALMA this system at a higher resolution and on a longer wavelength. So here I show you the continued image. We use band four, so 2.1 millimeter at 100 milliseconds resolution. So basically like 15 AU. So you can see here that we uh, clearly detected the, the ring of dust. We clearly detect the cavity. We can even start looking at some bright peaks here on the north part of the disk. The north part is uh, brighter, a little bit brighter than the south one, and that is also being reported in, in the past. But if you look at the radial intensity profile of the system, which is shown here on the right on, with, the, with the red line, uh, you can see that the emission can be well fitted with a Gaussian profile, which is the solid black line here. The emission is clearly peaking around 90 AU, more or less. And we found something very interesting. We found this excess of emission inside 40 AU. So what we wanted to do here was use these new observations with archive observations of the source, like the one that I showed you before, to estimate the spectral index of the emission and be able to characterize a little bit more the dust content in this system. So uh, that is what we did. So we use archive observations at band seven, so 0.9 millimeters, the one that I, I showed you previously, and also at band six at 1.3 millimeter. So here I show you the radial intensity profiles for the three data sets. And so an important thing uh, that you have to take into account when you want to estimate the spectral index is that all your data sets have to be at the same resolution. So we have to lower a little bit the resolution of our data and we end up with a data set at about 220 milliseconds, so around 35 AU in resolution. So here I show you the normalized radar intensity profiles. You can see that all of them are peaking more or less around 90 AU. And we are still seeing this excess of emission um, above the emission of the band seven, so the, the, the blue line here. And given that in band seven, you expect the disk to be brighter, so we can interpret this uh, emission um, as probably related to free-free emission more than to an inner disk, because if there were an inner disk there, uh, the band seven observation should be able to detect it. So free-free emission has been detected in other systems as well, and they, are, they seem to be brighter at longer wavelengths, and that can be related to stellar winds or to a radio jet. But we need follow-up observations in order to really um, know the origin of this excess of emission. So we, we, we have all these three data sets and we estimate the spectral index of the emission. So here I show you the results from the spectral index of the source. In this case, we're only using the best in signal to noise um, data set that we have. So the band four and the band seven observations. And you see that the spectral index as a function of, of radius is basically almost constant throughout the ring. So here I show you the spectral index from 60 to 120 AU, uh, because this is where the, the emission from the, from the dusty beam is expected to be. So uh, we have an average value of the spectral index, which is alpha here of 3.34. And what we wanted to do now is, is uh, try to estimate the maximum grain size, which has been related to the spectral index uh, previously. So we did that. Um, by using two different approaches. So the first one is using the classical approach. So in that uh, approach, you assume that the emission is optically thin and you are not including a scattering effect. So for that, the spectral index is just uh, found by this relationship where beta here is the, the absorption coefficient. And this absorption coefficient um, is related to the maximum grain size. And assuming all of this, we found uh, a maximum grain size from one millimeter to 2.5 millimeter, depending on the slope for the grain size distribution that you use. So we found that the, the grains should be at the, at the millimeter uh, range in, in the system. But given that the emission at, proto, uh, at two millimeter wavelength in protoplanetaries can be optically thick, can suffer from also from scattering effects, we wanted to do a more realistic approach so what we did was um, use a model that um, 
include optical depth effects, so we are not assuming any optical depth at any wavelength, and also including a scattering effects. So basically, we we are we doing a radial feeding of the ALMA SED that we have, so with, with these three uh, continuing observations. Um, and in that sense, the three parameters of our model is only the dose surface density and the maximum grain size. And that is because we are fixing the dose temperature uh, by the, the one expected for a possibly irradiating flare test. So with all of this, what we wanted to do is uh, feed uh, radially the, the observations and try to estimate simultaneously the optical depth, the dose surface density, and also the maximum grain size in the disk. So as I, as I uh, told you, uh, we included the scattering effects using the solution found in Sierra 2019, which has been used to characterize the dust properties in HL Tau following this work from Carrasco Gonzalez 2019. So we're basically following the same methodology as in these papers. So what we do is that the optical depth here, this is the tau here, is just the dose surface density times the opacity. And in this case, in the optically uh, thin regime, uh, this opacity is just the absorption um, opacity. Uh, you see that the opacity have a dependency uh, of frequency as a power law, and also the optical depth will have that same uh, dependency. So what we did was include this extinction coefficient here, which is including the absorption, but also the scattering emission. So a, a, a dose grain on the disk will uh, emit thermal emission, and it will not be absorbed right away, but it will scatter and then will absorb it in a different position. Um, so we are including anisotropic scattering by including this um, coefficient here, which is the uh, scattering, the efficiency of the scattering, where this parameter G here is the asymmetric parameter. And it's very important to uh, know that our model also includes or take into account uh, those superstructures because we are not uh, assuming any uh, a constant uh, grain size distribution, but this uh, those grain size distribution can vary also with radial distance from the star. So we use this model to fit our data set, <clears throat> multi wavelength data set. And these are the results. So for the optical depth, we found, uh, I show you here, this is the optical depth as a function of radius. Again, this is only valid around 60 AU to 120 AU. <clears throat> and you can see here that uh, the solid lines are uh, indicative of the more general case included scattering, while the dashed lines are the pure absorption case for each band. So you can see that if you're not including a scattering, <clears throat> you are underestimating the optical depth. So it's very important to have uh, this process into account when a study protoplanetary disks. So we found that the, the peak optical depth that we, that we found for this system is around 0.1 to 0.6, uh, including a scattering that is very similar to the, the values found for the DHR sample and is even lower without a scattering up to 0 0.01 for the longest wavelength. So we know that the emission in this ring is not optically thick, uh, so we can use this data to properly characterize the dust in this system. So now for the, for the dust surface density and the, dust, uh, and the maximum grain size, here I show you the results. So on the, on the right, it is the, the maximum grain size profiled. Um, Again, uh, this is only valid around 60 to 120 AU. Uh, you can see that the maximum grain size seems to be um, almost constant throughout the, the ring system. Uh, here in this plot, the white solid line highlights the best uh, model. The dash uh, black lines indicates the uncertainty at two sigma. And the vertical dash line, uh, what is, um, uh, highlighting is the 90 AU where the, the continuum uh, peaks. And you can see that we found more or less an average value for the maximum grain size of 0.61 millimeter. Um, one thing that we can do using this uh, type of, uh, of model is that from the dose surface density, which is the one here on the left, we can integrate that profile and get a more robust and realistic uh, mass of solids in the system. So that's what we did. And we found that the, the dose mass is around 31.3 air masses. So one important thing here is that when you compare these values uh, with the classical approach, so again, assuming optically thin emission and without including a scattering, you can see that you can easily underestimate the mass of a, 
of solids in their system. In our case, is around two or three, a factor of two or three. Um, but you also overestimate the maximum uh, grain size, as you can see here. So it seems that, that the, the bigot factor contributed to the underestimation of the mass in protoplanetary disks, especially in submillimeter surveys done so far, is not including this optical depth and also scattering effects. Because in these uh, submillimeter surveys, you not only assuming optical thin emission and not including scattering, but you also assume a single dose opacity and a single dose temperature. So this can be um, a solution for the mass bucket problem uh, for planet formation, where dust mass in protoplanetary disks um, estimated in submillimeter surveys appears to be too low to form the observed exoplanetary systems. But of course, this is, do, this is done by assuming optically thin emission. So we have two possibilities here. The first one is that planets form extremely fast. So we are actually observing a system that already have formed planets and that's why we estimate such a low mass. But the other possibility is that this optically thin emission is actually the wrong assumption. And that's why you are underestimating uh, your mass. So uh, all the, the evidence in this work also have pointing to uh, this part here where the optically thin emission is probably what is wrong in these estimates. So putting uh, trust 91 in context and, and getting back to the spectral index, what we did was compare the spectral index of trust 91, in this case, the integrated spectral index that I, I show you here. So this is the spectral index from one to three millimeter as a function of one uh, flux at one millimeter. And we compared it with the lupus this population where this source is. So the, the spectral index have been widely used as a proxy for grain size so basically lower spectral indices uh, implies uh, bigger grains. But you have to be careful here because optical depth effects also produce the same outcome. So as pointed out by Sue uh, 2019, uh, if you have optically thick uh, emission and also um, scattering effects, then this will, this will lower your spectral index. So it's not that simple to um, relate the spectral index with uh, grain growth. And you can see here that uh, Charles 91 um, appears as an outlier with the highest spectral index uh, compared to the rest of the population in lupus, which are here. So these works over here, uh, where I, I, I get the values from the spectral index, they found a tentative trend that transitional disks have a little higher uh, spectral index, which are here uh, highlighted with an additional circle. But uh, still, Charles 91 seems to be at least 1.5 times higher in spectral index. So how can we explain this? Well, one of the uh, explanation for this is that extended optically thick regions in these non-resolved sources in lupus uh, may account for this low alpha because most of the, of the population in lupus are composed of compact small discs that are probably optically thick at submillimeter wavelength. And that is why producing this low alpha. So something that we uh, found that is very interesting is that even though Charles 91 appears like an outlier when compared with lupus population, if you compare this, uh, their spectral index with other transitional disks in other regions, you can see here that um, it behaves as expected for a transitional disk with a huge cap -D. So here I show you the spectral index again from one to three millimeter more or less with cavity size for a sample of transitional disks and pre-transitional disks. So this sample is taken from the work of Pinilla 2014, where they found this relationship between the spectral, the millimeter spectral index and cavity size. So they explained it, uh, this relationship because those at, uh, at this uh, submillimeter uh, wavelengths are going to be dominated by the rim of those, right? That is located at the pressure bump. So wider cavities implies that the pressure bump is further out from the star and in there, uh, the maximum grain size is going to be lower or smaller. So smaller particles will then experience a lower radial drift. And that will make that turbulent motions will be the main source of destructive collisions. So in, in that case, the maximum grain size is rich when you have this balance between the fragmentation velocity and the turbulence relative velocity of the particles. And at that point, the maximum grain size will also scale 
with the gas surface density, which uh, decreased will rather distant from the star. So you can see that trust 91 um, perfectly fits this relationship and it behaves as expected for a transitional disk uh, with a huge cavity. So something that we can also do with the, with the spectral index, so now I, I've been showing the, the integrated spectral index, but something that we can also do is to estimate an spectral index map using again our the band four and the band seven observations in ALMA. And that's what we did. So here is the, again, the, the green of dust. The contours are uh, the continuum um, observations at band four. And you can see in colors, the, the spectral index. Uh, of course, we, as you can see here, we didn't find any clear trend of increasing values of the spectral index uh, with radius, which is what you expect uh, for, for green growth and rather drift. But of course, we need a higher resolution to be able to really um, resolve this in the rather direction and be able to say anything about uh, radial modulations of the spectral index. And we didn't find any a clear trend uh, of variation, azimuthal variations in the disk, or at least not a general um, azimuthal variation. But uh, we, we found a hint of a lower value in one of the posi position of the bright blots uh, north, the ones that you see on the on the continuum uh, observations. So this is the bright blot, one of the bright blots there. And you can see that uh, compared to the surroundings, uh, the, the, the value of the spectral index here is a little slightly lower uh, than the surroundings. So it might imply a grain growth there, but of course we need follow-up observations in order to really see if this might be a potential local concentration of those. Uh, there, but it's again uh, very interesting. So um, now that we have all these results, uh, given these multi-wavelength observations, how we interpret these uh, observational results. So basically for the optical depth um, that we found between 0.2 and 0.6, there have been uh, two proposed scenarios, as far as I know. Um, the first one is explained through an opacity effect so for that, we have this work from Xu, uh, 2019, when they propose that this optical depth seen in protoplanetary disks, specifically in the D-sharp sample, uh, might be explained by an optically thick disk, but with reduced um, brightness because of scattering. So uh, for that, you need uh, dose albedo, so the, the effective of the, of the reflectivity of the dose, about 0.9, which implies maximum grain size from 0.1 to 1 millimeter. So what they explain in this uh, work is that actually submillimeter ALMA observations are not optically thin, so they are not proving exactly the mid-plane, but they are proving a layer a little above the mid-plane. So in order to estimate, for example, a uh, good robust uh, estimate or value of the mass, you need to go to longer wavelengths, so BLA, centimeter observations, in order to prove very deep at the mid-plane. So they explained it that um, optically thick emission actually will be consistent with a spectral index around two. And then you will have a sharp transition in the spectral index when the, the, the emission is getting optically thin, above 2.5. So this type of, of a scenario is well um, described or well seen in this new or recent paper from Macias of this year, where they use multi-wavelength observations from ALMA and from the BLA uh, to characterize the dust in the TW Hydra. So here is the continued image of TW Hydra at 1.3 millimeter. And here I showed you the spectral index of, of that system as a function of radius. And you can see that it happens exactly how Xu explained it. So the inner disk seem to be um, optically thick at this uh, wavelength. So we have an spectral index around two, and then you have this sharp transition. So the increase of the spectral index from above 2.5 up to three or four. So these, they explain it as uh, an optical depth effects where when you go further out from the star, the emission is getting optically thin at two millimeter wavelength, and that's where you have an increase in the spectral index. So can we explain our optical depth with this scenario? Well, one thing that they um, say in this work is that this uh, scenario is only valid for the inner disk, so re ready within 50 AU. And we know that trust 91 is a very extended dust ring, so it's picking about 90 AU. So this scenario might not be 
uh, applicable in our case, we know that uh, the, the RINs uh, that we model, the, the right intensity profiles that we model, can be well fitted by a Gaussian profile, which is also consistent with the emission being optically thin. If you have optically thick emission, then you will have more like a, a flat top uh, profile. So we can see that our emission is not optically thick and this scenario might not be valid. So what is the other possibility? So what we try to do here uh, in this paper is try to see if planetesimal formation might be a, a possible scenario to explain these observational uh, results. So in that uh, regard, we have this work from Stanler 2019, where they use a 1D model where it includes dust growth, fragmentation, and also planetesimal formation through the streaming instability. And they use this model to explain the emission from the second ring of this source, HD 163296. So you can see here that the model that they use, here I show you the distribution of the of dust in color. And you can see that they use a, 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 this model with a gap at about 83 AU and a dust ring at about 100 U. So um, it's very similar to the position and to the width of the ring that we found in TRAS-91. So we wanted to compare our results with these uh, models that uh, they use and they even evolve the model uh, through time. So you can see that they can also explain these optical uh, peak optical uh, values of the D-chart sample, at least the, the rings in the D-chart sample, uh, by using this planetesimal formation. So here I show you on the bottom the optical depth profiles uh, as a function of distance. Again, the ring is speaking around here, about 100 U, and you can see that uh, through time they can be able to explain the peak intensity uh, optical depth uh, from, for this source. But uh, how can we explain this? Well, they explain it because if you see here, the evolution of the peak uh, optical depth here, if you don't include planetesimal formation, then you expect that your peak optical depth will increase to very high uh, values, which is the, the dotted line here. But once you include planetesimal formation, then you basically remove millimeter particles to form uh, these bigger, bigger uh, objects, these planetesimals, and that will produce a decrease in the optical depth and will produce that the optical depth uh, will be on the observed range of values. So the, how, that's how I explain this optical depth uh, range. But also, and more importantly, they also observe the evolution of the spectral index. So that is here below. And you can see that uh, for the spectral index uh, between 1.25 and three microns as a function of the distance from the star, uh, from about 1 million, 1 million years to 13 million years, you can see that uh, once planetesimal formation acts in the system and below these bigger objects, the spectral index seems to reach a minimum value. As you can see here, the, the, the yellow and the red line, and they cluster around these values from three to 3.5, uh, and the spectral index is almost flat throughout the ring of dust. So this is very similar to what we found in our system in Charles 91. So we believe that uh, given all these uh, signatures, these results, we have optical depth um, around this uh, range uh, of values. We also have an spectral index that is almost flat throughout the ring uh, with values around three and 3.5, similar to what uh, Stanner found from their model. Uh, we believe that um, planetesimal formation might be a plausible a scenario to explain um, these observational signatures in, in TRAS-91. Of course, we now know that uh, dust is actually accumulating in the ring and is growing because we found maximum grain sizes in the order of 0.6 millimeter. So we know, we know that dust is getting trapped here, but also, uh, um, ALMA observations are not sensitive to um, centimeter particles. So centimeter particles can also be uh, present in this ring. Uh, in fact, uh, a standard found for their model that the maximum grain size found in, in, in this case is around three centimeters. So it's uh, possible that centimeter particles is also present in this ring of dust. And as pointed out uh, recently in this work from Carrera uh, this year, uh, the planetesimal formation is an extremely robust process once you have a centimeter particles in the system. So we believe that planetesimal formation uh, may be a plausible scenario to explain these uh, observations. So finally, 
uh, I leave you with my conclusion. So we obtain a 2.1 millimeter alpha observations at about 0.1 our second resolution for this uh, trust one one system. We resolve the ring of dust, which is peaking around 90 AU from the central star. Uh, by using these multi-wavelength observations, we found that uh, the spectral index is almost constant throughout the ring with an average value of 3.34. We compared this uh, spectral index with the dispopulations in lupus, and we found that TRAS-91 has highlighted as a, as a source with the highest spectral index. But of course, uh, this can be explained if uh, optically thick regions in these unresolved sources that are mostly composed of small deaths uh, may be explained this uh, low uh, spectral index for the, rest, for the rest of the population in lupus. And we also compare uh, Trust 91 with transitional disease in other regions, and we found that it behaves as expected for a transitional disease with a, with a huge cavity. And by performing a radial feeding of this ALMA uh, SED using a model that includes optical depth and cell scattering, we found that uh, optical depth values in the same range up for the D sharp sample, we found maximum grain size of 0.6 uh, millimeters and a dose mass of 31.3 error masses. So we interpret all of these as evidence of grain growth due to the accumulation of millimeter particles in the ring and possible ongoing plant decimal formation in a transitional disk. So thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you for your nice talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Or... Yes, we got a question from, from Skylar. Um, she says, very nice talk. In your radio fitting of the millimeter SED, the flat distribution of the maximum grain size with radius is very reassuring. Do you know what is the uh, what is limiting a constraint on the probabilities inside of the uh, for, uh, 40 AU? Is the limit imposed by the data or related to the dust model? Mm. Oh yeah, the the problem there that we couldn't constrain very well the the maximum grain size uh, and also the spectral index in the inner regions is because. Uh, since the dust is um, peaking at 90 AU, so the, actually the, the brightest part uh, is there. So the problem is that for our model, we are including um, in radial range, uh, so to speak, uh, the, the emission from the three data sets up to where all three uh, data have a signal to noise ratio of 1.5 at least. 1.5 or greater or larger. So the problem is that at the inner parts, uh, since there is no dust there, it's basically noise. So that is what is difficult for us to, to constrain very well the, the maximum grain size and basically the dust surface density and the spectral index in the inner regions is because the emission there is really noisy because you don't have the emission from the dust ring there. You're welcome. Okay, are there more questions? Ah, Camber. Uh, raise her hands. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Karina. That was a really great talk. Um, seeing this slide reminds me. Um, I, I like your point about including scattering effects when you're you're trying to translate the the dust emission into a mass. Um, how much more computationally intensive is that than our like traditional analytical conversion from uh, flux to, to mass. Yeah. 
Well, um, as far as I know, because this part, of course, was uh, done in collaboration with Sierra and in Carrasco, in Carrasco Gonzalez, but they they have this model. And honestly, I don't think it takes that much. I think um, you can really do like a very good fit and a very good model in like a day or something. So it's not that computationally demanding to be able to include um, the the optical depth and the scattering effects in your data set. So it's not that computationally demand. Um, and I think it's worth it because you estimate more realistic all of these important parameters. So as far as I know, it's not that demanding. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So if there are no more questions, then let's thank uh, Karina again for giving a nice presentation. And we will see uh, each other again next week for the next Origin Seminar. <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you.